Okay, so I just finished The Butcher in the Room, and I listened to it on audiobook because the author who wrote it, Elena, your 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 quart. I'm not sure how you say her last name, but she has a podcast, the Morbid Podcast, which is a true crime podcast. And so um, I really wanted to listen to it because, as someone who does a podcast, um, I thought maybe the auto the audio version of it would be really cool. But this is her debut debut novel, and um, and so yeah. So what really caught me was the cover kind of and just the name. <laughs> so. I like the premise too of the dueling narrators. So it's a serial killer and then also the medical examiner or autopsy physician. Um, like there are different points of view and not just him trying to commit the crimes, but her trying to solve the crimes. And then of course it involves the other police individuals who are trying to stop the crimes from happening. So, <clears throat> and um, okay, so just a little bit of a spoiler warning or not spoiler, a trigger warning. This is pretty gory. It has um, very descriptive medical um, information and it does have torture in it. So yeah, um, death, torture, gore, um, yeah, pretty scary. <laughs> so, but I'm not a huge thing of gore just for the sake of gore, um, but I actually really enjoyed this one. Um, because the gore was a part of the story and it really gave a lot of insight into the serial killer and into the medical examiner. Okay, so this is going to have spoilers. So, um, yeah, so if you want to know whether to read this book, if you like Dexter, then read the book. Okay, so, um, or listen to the book. I loved listening to it. Okay, so I'm going to get into it. <laughs> this is going to have... A summary and a discussion and yeah and then I want you to leave your comments about what you thought about it and what you enjoyed and didn't enjoy that sort of thing too so we start out and um, with the silver serial killer Jeremy and then we have the medical examiner Ren and um, Jeremy is um, uh, quite a likable character. He's fluffy blonde hair, apparently, um, which that's the big thing is um, we are into his mind before we ever know what he actually looks like, which was quite interesting trying to picture a character in a book that we don't have any visual descriptors for really yet, but we know what is in his mind. So Jeremy has three different individuals trapped in um, his basement and um he um it starts out pretty gorgeous like by chapter two you're just like oh um so he has them captured and we're not quite sure what he's going to do with them and they're pretty scared and one of them she won't stop screaming and it's annoying him so he goes down they're tied up and everything so he goes down and he pulls out her fingernail like literally takes flyers and pulls out her fingernail and tells her to shut up or he's gonna pull out more whoa yeah that's where it went right away so he then um we have uh katie who is down there we have um emily and then we have the guy who's also been captured and i cannot think of his name right now um mark or something like that he's not real important but um he does get killed so they um, are trapped down there, and the next thing you know, they have been released into this kind of wooded area, and we think that he's, like, giving them a shot to escape, but yet we, we can see, because we're in his mind, that he's sitting back and watching them, and he has his gun ready and everything, and um, there's an electrified fence, and so they are, um, Katie and Emily kind of team up and are trying to figure out how to escape and um, like what, how to get out of these woods. And uh, one of uh, Emily is trying to convince Katie to you know, shut up, turn off the flashlight. Like you are just drawing him to us. He can track us because of what you're doing. And so then we alternate with Ren and she's a medical examiner and so the she's working with the police who have found a body and so she goes to help the police determine the manner of death the timing of death all of that kind of stuff 
And so then Jeremy starts out on this kind of cat and mouse chase. Um, and we know he's kind of taunting the police, but we don't really know why. And um, so he's leaving bodies and he does such things as one of the bodies. Um, it's a jazz festival, I think is what it was, but it was a music festival. And so he puts one of the bodies at the festival in like, um, and they know they need to go find this body. And so Ren, of course, is like, um, we need to look for bot flies um, because I guess those are the specific kind of flies that are attracted to um, dying or decaying matter. So she like helps them try and figure out where, and sure enough, there's this like buzzing swarm of flies. And so she even crawls down under this wooded, um, like bal not balcony, cause it's not a balcony, but um, like stage kind of thing and crawls under there and sees the dead girl. Oh yeah. I mean, can you imagine crawling down there in the dark and looking at this body? So she gets under there and there's a map there. And so then they are going to go and try and find the other body. And there's a, um, she knows there's a smartwatch on the body. And so she's like, um, this has not been scraped up. It has, it doesn't have dirt on it because the body that she finds has like the feet are, her feet are all torn up. This girl's obviously been running for her life and, um, feet kicked in mud. There's blood everywhere. She has a wound in her back that the killer has then um, bandaged up. So, yeah. So, which is weird because she goes into how serial killers, there's not really a serial, serial killer that wounds their victim, but then bandages it up or does um, when the whole point is to kill them. And obviously he did kill her. So that was interesting. So then we go to, um, they're trying to um, track down the body and the smartwatch has a timer on it. And so they finally figure out where to go hunt for this body in the woods. They all start digging. And even the um, first responders, the paramedics and people that are there, they even start trying to dig and get this body like up to try and save her life. So they get the body dug up, the timer goes off and, but the person, the girl in it is still alive. And um, they figure out that he had um, made a wound in her back to paralyze her um, or kill her. They're not real sure which one. But then we get to go into his mindset where he goes into all about how, and I just had to sneeze again. <laughs> I've been so sick lately. Okay, so then we go into his mind where he's talking about like where in the spinal cord you um, would make an injury, like with a knife straight in between the bones in the spinal cord to either paralyze someone, kill them. Um, and one of the methods he talks about with killing them is that it will um, make them feel like they're suffocating because their lungs, it's the nerve that helps your lungs remember to breathe. So it's very traumatic death. And, um, and we even get to see him taunting one of the girls with like, oh, this is the wound, um, and this is why I make it here. I'm not that cruel. I'm not going to place it where you're going to feel like you're suffocating and you're basically just going to die of not being able to breathe because your lungs can't move. So, um, they dig up the body. She has the wound in her back, but she's still alive. And so he freaks out um, that she's still alive. But lo and behold, then he says, well... I screwed this up, but it's not that bad of a screw up because he gave her, I guess, hemlock poisoning um, that he had done, which will kill her anyways, um, even though she's still alive. So we know that this girl is going to die, even though we see them finding her alive and thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to be able to help her and everything. So then we um, go back into his mindset where he is then... Um, tracking down the two girls, Emily and Katie. And um, then we get to a big twist. And this is about halfway. And it's a huge twist. And I didn't see it coming. Looking back, there were probably some clues where I probably should have known this was coming. But um, so he, it turns out that Ren is actually Emily that we've been following all along that Jeremy slash Cal has captured. 
okay? So then you start tracing back and the girl, Emily, was a med school student and one of her, I think it was her biology partner, lab partner, um, Cal. So he um, had befriended her kind of and lo and behold, he kidnapped her. And so Emily is one of the people that he had kidnapped. And then the other two, Katie and the guy, were just people that he met at a bar and they annoyed him. And so he um, offered drugs to them if they would come back to his house with them. Yeah, and so then that's how they got captured. Okay, well, so then we get to the part where Emily and Katie are in the area where he's like hunting them down like um, wounded animals. And he has um, put these drops into Emily's eyes, like what they use to dilate your eyes at the eye doctor's office apparently to where she can only see like right in front of him, kind of, uh, in front of her kind of. So he tracks her down and she's stumbling all around because she can't move. And then lo and behold, he had also given, given her a drug that um, kind of, it's like, per, like temporary paralysis kind of thing where then your legs can't move. So then we find, see him and he's got Emily down and then he's talking about the different ways to make the cuts in the spinal cord. And he supposedly like does this um, in her spinal cord where then um, she will eventually die. And so then we see him hunting down Katie, the other girl who gets killed also. And then lo and behold, what happens is Emily was faking being dead. She just kind of pretended and laid there and waited for him to move on. And so then Emily takes and they're in, even though you think they're in the woods, they're actually in this like electrified fence area, even though it is like nature, like out in a forest. And so she takes Katie's body and puts it on top of the electric fence so that she can climb over the fence and escape. So lo and behold, Emily actually escaped and Emily is written. And so um, Jeremy slash Cal is who Emily and Ren know him as. He is taunting Ren with killing these people and leaving clues um, because he's mad that she escaped. And meanwhile, Ren has like moved on, finished medical school. She's married, has a nice house. Um, she still has fears, of course, and gets paralyzed by um, kind of anxiety. But the great thing is she recognizes it. And she even at one point when she's doing an autopsy of one of the girls where she realizes that she knows who the killer is and that it's Cal who had kidnapped her and tried to kill her. Um, LaRue, who she uh, is on the case with, he's the actual detective. Um, he tells her like, maybe this is too hard for you because you have a personal um, thing in this. Like you want to see him caught because he's the one who kidnapped you and tried to kill you. And so she even goes, yeah, you're right. This is too much for me. And she steps back and lets um, someone else take over the autopsy, one of her um, residents, I guess, that's there training with her. So then um, they then, um, she can't stand to not go and try and hunt him down though. Like she just can't take it, she has to do it. So she goes and she's following the detectives around and she finally starts connecting some things in her mind where like one, there was a lady who died in the hospital that she did the autopsy for. And um, I think the lady's name was Maureen or that might be the wrong name. But anyways, it's an elderly lady and she like remembers because the lady looked like, she's like, oh, she looks just like a Doris or Maureen or whatever her name was. And um, this lady was an older lady and the she was brought in by her son who said she had been kind of suicidal and she came in and she actually died of hemlock poisoning supposedly by having she there was some hemlock that she mixed in with her nightly red wine and drank it and she died and emily slash wren actually did the autopsy for the body so then one of the girls who um had died that she's doing that she didn't finish the autopsy but she started the autopsy on the body had hemlock in it and so she makes this connection that um, those two have to be related. And she starts remembering back to when she was kidnapped and um, left for dead, that um, he has to live in a secluded far, like a house by himself. And it's probably his family's house that he inherited. So she starts thinking about it and looking back. 
And then meanwhile, then she makes a connection with one of the bodies, the first body that I, I think we find her working on in the book, um, where a portion of a chapter of a book is missing and like pages have been stuffed down um, the girl's body from the book. And so she makes the connection, finds the actual, and he leaves the book and there's a name in the book that the book was originally checked out to. The only problem is, the place, the library where the book was checked out from is like way off, away from where these bodies are. And so, and it's old, like, like how are we gonna make that connection? You know, obviously you just found this book and put it there, but not really. So um, she starts um, making connections in her mind once she has been able to take a step back and think about things that Cal said to her when he was trying to befriend her. And one of the things he talked about was one of his friends went from whenever he was young and he gives off the name and she makes the connection that that name is the same name that as what the name in the library book had been checked out to. So she makes that connection. So she tells LaRue, she's like, oh my gosh, go back, find the guy who this book had been checked out to and um, see if he remembers this guy named Cal from childhood. And then she remembers when she had been kidnapped, Katie, the other girl said his name was Jeremy. And um, she was like, no, his name was Cal. But so she starts connecting things. So then um, LaRue goes back, finds the young boy that the book was originally checked out to when he was a kid. And sure enough, that guy knew a guy named Jeremy and he, the kid had moved away. So then they start figuring out um, how to make the connections. And she remembers the old lady who had died of the hemlock poisoning. So they look up who her son is and where she lived. So they're tracking him down. Meanwhile, um, he knows that his victim has lived. And uh, so he's frustrated with himself. So, I mean, being the idiot that he freaking is, he's not a very smart killer, but. Anyways, he goes and picks up this girl in this slinky blue dress at a bar. And lo and behold, she is a lawyer who passed the bar, but she just got fired from her job. She's, so she's kind of down the dumps, drinking her sorrows away and everything. So, and she is annoying to him apparently, but he picks her up, tells her, oh, he notices that there's blood on the inside of her nose, which I guess it, we're supposed to know that's a sign that they do cocaine, I think is, he calls a blow. So, um, he tells her he has blow back at his house. And so he goes and gets her to leave with him. So she leaves with him and then he gets to this wooded area and he's like, oh, we're close. You know, I know this road, all this kind of stuff. Let's go for a walk, you know? And then it gets really creepy because he then starts um, talking to her and then all of a sudden he just like, like turns over and goes, run like so spooky this would be a pr i mean i can just imagine the movie setting where that's happening and the actor being like run and so she starts running he is lazy and um tries to kill her tries to slit her throat and um but lo and behold there's two hunters out there hunting so they hear the commotion because they'd heard her scream and um he thinks he slit her throat so he leaves and even though he knows he's been a moron and that that was stupid, he should have done it, he didn't think it out. Um, the hunters find her and lo and behold, she doesn't die either. He didn't correctly um, slice her neck where he would cut the carotid artery is what he was aiming for. So she lives too. So she can't speak because he actually did sever one of her um, uh, vocal cords. And so, but she writes out to the um, medical personnel, Jeremy, the name, and then um, Ren and LaRue are like, okay, we've got him now. So they go out, they find the house, and meanwhile, he knows he's freaking screwed. So first of all, he has one of the bodies down in the basement, and so he unplugs, and I think we're supposed to know it's Katie's body, but I might be making that leap there. Um, because I thought maybe that's why it was Katie's body is because that's the girl that Wren um, had been left for dead with. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Looking back, now that I'm thinking. Um, so he, the body's in the freezer, he unplugs it so that the stench will start like, oh, bad. And then he, um, he leaves, um, but the police get there and there's this whole, um, 
They find the body. Oh, and then the other thing is, oh, this was the freaking creepy part. Jeremy had snuck into Rune's house while her and her husband were in bed sleeping. And he would scouted out that how he could get in through her basement and through a window that had been like painted shut and the lock didn't work and it got left alone. So he sneaks in through the basement. Her and her husband are laying in bed sleeping. He sneaks in and is like watching them sleep. And he takes this um, antique ring that's filled with diamonds that was her grandmother's um, that is on the bedside table and he takes it and he um, like, and there's dust. So obviously it stays on her bedside table. And he talks about how, oh, it's not something she wears. It's just a comfort mechanism for her. And so then, um, okay. So then they're hunting him down. And lo and behold, that ring is on a shawl, like a mantle kind of thing or shelf. I don't know what you call it. Um, where Ren sees it and she's like, holy crap, Lou, that's my ring. And, um, yeah, and she's like, it's, it sits on my bedside table. I don't wear it because it's too small, but I have it beside me because it was my grandmother's. And so then um, she's like, oh, no, like he's been taunting me. He was drawing me out here. And so then um, she sees the person across the way and the police are moving in and they're like trying to make the um, move to get him to surrender. Um, and then one of the officers fires off a shot and it's not a mortal wound, um, but then he then um, has a weapon with him and he then shoots himself. And so the police close in and they go up there and Ren gets up there and she's like, it's not him. And they're all like, what do you mean? You, we saw you look at him and recognize that that was actually um, the killer. And she's like, no, it's not him. She was like, if this was a self-inflicted gunshot wound, where's the gun? And she was like, where is the place where you shot him when you first saw him? And sure enough, the evidence doesn't measure up and they have made a mistake. And so then they all freak out because obviously this was just a tactic that he utilized, he utilized so that he could escape. And so then the book ends with him like walking down the street, like he's escaped. And um, Bran is like, like, I'm never gonna get, be able to get past this. I'm like, as long as he's out there, like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. So the ending was totally uh, like, oh, I was pissed because I wanted an ending. Like I really was invested in Ren and I really felt for her as a survivor. She never really played the victim part, even though she was traumatized at certain points. Um, she definitely um, did what she could do to move past and to help others um and so to have that ending happen was just oh gut-wrenching like but it does open it up for a sequel so hopefully we will find ren trying to track him down still and it just really sucks because well first of all we know he's not that good of a killer because he's not that smart and he keeps talking about oh his greatest asset is patience and i'm like dude you have no patience you just went and got this girl from a bar with no plan whatsoever and picked her up and then tried to leave her for dead like yeah that didn't work you're not so smart so <clears throat> definitely leaves it open for a sequel and i hope there's a sequel because i want to see him go down he needs to go down definitely this was amazing because it was gory but it wasn't gross gory in a way because every description of whether it was um, him trying to kill them or in the autopsy room, them like looking at um, what had been placed down in their throat, all of that sort of thing. Um, it was all very almost scientific and almost respectful of the body. Um, so it's very interesting that for someone who doesn't really like gore, I really got into the score and I don't know if it was because of the medical terminology or the scientific aspects of it and the way it, you really wanted to know about the gore in order to try and solve the crime and identify Jeremy slash Cal. Um, this was a gore that I liked. I mean, I was all into the gore. <laughs> so this was a five star read for me and I really liked it and I really hope there's a sequel. So yeah, so good. <laughs>